Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Everything was completely destroyed by a cataclysm in the stunning nation of England. What happened? Is this a sign of God? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. Let's get started. Rivers bursting their banks and flooding homes in England have become an all too frequent occurrence. With the latest bout of severe weather wreaking havoc, particularly in the areas of South Manchester and Yorkshire, the situation has escalated to the point where authorities are now faced with the daunting task of evacuating hundreds of homes in South Manchester. Prompted by the issuance of two severe flood warnings in the region, the relentless downpour of heavy rain has transformed tranquil waterways into raging torrents, inundating streets, homes, and businesses, and leaving communities grappling with the devastating aftermath of the deluge. However, do you still remember Noah's Flood? Noah's Flood is one of the most recognized Bible stories. According to the Old Testament, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. As the text recounts, God saw wickedness within humans and sent a global inundation. Because Noah was righteous, God instructed him to build an ark for his family and save two of every beast, bird, and creeping thing. Is it true that this is the wrath of God coming down? Oh my God, the roof is terrible in South Manchester where the floodwaters have surged with alarming speed. Residents find themselves forced to abandon their homes as the rising tide threatens to engulf everything in its path. The impacts of these floods extend far beyond the immediate damage to property and infrastructure. Lives are disrupted, livelihoods threatened, and communities left reeling from the sudden onslaught of nature's fury. As you can see, God has truly poured out his wrath on us. Or rather, for those who don't know how to repent. But wrath does not mean lack of love. Do you know what? After the storm, it snows. In some areas, a lot of snow fell, much to the delight and excitement of the locals. This unexpected abundance of snow brought with it a sense of wonder and joy as the landscape transformed into a winter wonderland right before their eyes. Children eagerly donned their warmest winter gear, ready to venture outside and build snowmen, have snowball fights, and create memories that would last a lifetime. Snow is a metaphor of purity and cleanliness, as evidenced by some of the most beautiful passages in Scripture. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. God will save those who repent. This is a good sign because after the flood, there was snow. If you think positively, everything will be fine. God's Salvation Salvation is God's grace. It is the gift of freedom from our sins that Jesus made possible by taking the punishment for our sins on the cross. Through this gift, 1 John 1 verse 9 promises that if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is one of the most important promises of Scripture. It gives us freedom and hope for the future. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds too easy. Even though it may seem too good for words or completely different from anything you have ever experienced before, it is the truth of God. This is the beauty and mystery of grace, receiving forgiveness that we don't deserve. Salvation is for something, not just from it. Sometimes it seems like the Christian life is all about being saved and then helping other people get saved. But when we go a little deeper, we discover that being saved means that we are saved not only from something, our sins, but also for something. We are saved so that we can carry out the purpose for which God has us on earth, to share the good news of God's grace and to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. Of course, God's salvation means God will return. Jesus will come back soon. However, no one knows the exact time when Jesus is coming again. Mark 13 verse 32 says, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
Interestingly, the disciples asked Jesus the same question just before he returned to heaven. At that time, Jesus told them it was not for them to know the times or seasons which are in the Father's authority. Therefore, Jesus may come back tomorrow, next month, next year, or a hundred years from now. So what does this mean for you and me? Always be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Watch and focus on Jesus because the devil is seeking to distract mankind from understanding the signs and close of Jesus' coming. Jesus is patiently waiting to come back because he is giving humanity as much time as possible to choose and follow him. Jesus wants as many people as possible to repent and return to heaven with him. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Of course, God's salvation means God will return. Jesus will come back soon. However, no one knows the exact time when Jesus is coming again. Mark 13 verse 32 says, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Interestingly, the disciples asked Jesus the same question just before he returned to heaven. At that time, Jesus told them it was not for them to know the times or seasons which are in the Father's authority. Therefore, Jesus may come back tomorrow, next month, next year, or a hundred years from now. So what does this mean for you and me? Always be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Watch and focus on Jesus because the devil is seeking to distract mankind from understanding the signs and close of Jesus' coming. Jesus is patiently waiting to come back because he is giving humanity as much time as possible to choose and follow him. Jesus wants as many people as possible to repent and return to heaven with him. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Christians should be on guard, watching and praying until the day of the Lord. The Bible says in Luke 10 26, 21 colon 34 36, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We know Jesus' second coming will be a literal event and will be just like he went to heaven the first time. Acts 1 verses 9 to 11 says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The Bible says that the angels will return with Jesus, and they will come with a loud sound of the trumpet to gather from the whole earth those who have died in Christ. At Jesus' second coming, the righteous dead will be raised to life and taken up to heaven, along with the righteous who are still alive on the earth. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. When Jesus returns to earth, the wicked who are left alive will call for the rocks and hills to fall on them because they cannot look upon the face of Christ. The wicked will be destroyed with everlasting destruction because they did not know God or obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the moment of Jesus' second coming, at the last trumpet, the mortal bodies of the saved will be transformed, and they will receive immortal bodies. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, 
and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back to reward the inhabitants of the earth and bring many back to heaven with him. The Bible also says in Matthew 25 verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus more than anything wants to spend time with you. He invites you to return to heaven with him to enjoy an eternity with no more tears, pain, or suffering. What would keep you from accepting the invitation of Christ? What would keep you from putting him first in your life? What would be more important than saying, I want to pattern my life after Jesus and soon live with him forever? The work of the Holy Spirit and Christ's payment of the price for sin freed God to save sinners. This work in an individual begins with the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, creating a consciousness of sin and a sense of need for salvation. When the truth of the gospel that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for sin is learned, the Holy Spirit illumines the individual so that the message may be understood, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 11 to 12, and believed. Sinners receive redemption by believing that Jesus Christ died for their sins and was raised from the dead. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back to reward the inhabitants of the earth and bring many back to heaven with him. The Bible also says in Matthew 25 verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus more than anything wants to spend time with you. He invites you to return to heaven with him to enjoy an eternity with no more tears, pain, or suffering. What would keep you from accepting the invitation of Christ? What would keep you from putting him first in your life? What would be more important than saying, I want to pattern my life after Jesus and soon live with him forever? The work of the Holy Spirit and Christ's payment of the price for sin freed God to save sinners. This work in an individual begins with the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, creating a consciousness of sin and a sense of need for salvation. When the truth of the gospel that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for sin is learned, the Holy Spirit illumines the individual so that the message may be understood, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 11 to 12, and believed. Sinners receive redemption by believing that Jesus Christ died for their sins and was raised from the dead. The part repentance plays is trusting in Christ as Savior requires a change of mind about being a sinner, about the awfulness of sin, about not being able to make oneself acceptable to God by good works, and about who Jesus is and what he did. It also requires a change of confidence from self or any other to confidence in Jesus to save. This change is called repentance. Being convicted of sin and changing the mind about being a sinner can and should produce regret about being sinful, but sorrow alone is not sufficient. True repentance is also a conscious decision to trust Christ as Savior, a transfer of confidence from self to the Savior. The free gift of God's grace is received. Peter told those who had crucified the Lord Jesus that his resurrection and ascension into heaven proved he is both Lord and Christ. They were challenged to repent to receive forgiveness. This meant to change their minds about Jesus being the Messiah. They did, and their change of mind is described as those who had received his word. Paul coupled repentance with faith as two parts of one message. In Romans, he wrote that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Then he stated that the kindness of God leads to repentance. After that, he described being justified by faith. This sequence demonstrates that belief is the crucial issue in being saved and that a change of mind in repentance is included in believing. The mind is changed, transferring a person's trust from self to the Savior. Further proof that repentance does not need to be a separate or distinct act from faith is the Gospel of John. It is the one New Testament book written to tell someone how to be saved. Just 2021, 20, and the only requirement John gives is, believe. Sanctification begins at salvation. Positional sanctification is also given at the new birth. The new believer is immediately set apart to God in holiness and completely acceptable to God. For example, 
the Corinthians were called saints, but they needed to correct their behavior as described in the remainder of the epistle. Ultimate sanctification refers to the complete perfection in holiness that the believer will experience in the presence of God when glorified. In the present, the believer is to put away sin and practice righteousness, becoming sanctified. God's plan and will are that good works be done by every believer. The indwelling Holy Spirit provides supernatural power to produce the character qualities of Christ and to do good deeds that honor God. Sanctification, or becoming more like Christ, is to continue throughout life. However, the lives of many biblical characters, as well as many biblical passages, show clearly that sanctification in the life of a believer may take place rapidly or slowly and include a great amount of sin and failure, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 14 to 15, 5 colon 3 dash 6, 6 colon 8, Hebrews 5 verses 11 to 14, 12, 1 to 13. 2 Peter 2 verses 7 to 8, Revelation 2 verse 3. The Lordship of Christ and the Believer, since God is the all-powerful Creator and completely sovereign, Psalm 103 verse 19, and since Jesus Christ is declared to be the head of the Church, which is His body, Ephesians 5 verses 23 to 24, believers who are subjects in the Kingdom of God and members of the body of Christ owe Him allegiance and submission to His authority and direction. A decision to make Christ Lord in life may happen at the time of receiving Him as Savior, but it may also occur later. This is a process and a walk that continues throughout the life of a believer. Honest Christians cannot claim that Jesus Christ is Lord of every area of their lives at any one point. In the name, Lord Jesus Christ, the word, Lord, emphasizes His deity, the name, Jesus, is the human name given because He is the Savior, Matthew 1 verse 21 and the title, Christ, is the Messiah, the Anointed One, chosen to be the exclusive Savior. The commands to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to confess Him as Lord, and to call on the name of the Lord, Romans 10 verse 13, all refer to believing in His deity, that He is God. Lordship in life is the work that God begins to effect when a person is saved and new life has begun. This work continues throughout the life of the believer. Assurance of salvation is possible by knowing what the Word of God gives as the requirement for salvation and by knowing that the requirement has been met. It is stated above that faith in Jesus Christ as Savior is the only requirement to be saved. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video.